Hello and welcome to the Odd Couple Podcast. This is Siddharth here. And I am Dr. Shish. So today we are in the middle of the biggest revolution in motoring since Henry Ford's first production line started turning back in 1913. Elon Musk changed the tide with his iconic Tesla, urging other car manufacturers to invest more in electric vehicles. The future of mobility is at a critical point of inflection. Every time there's an oil spike or climate change is debated and discussed, electric vehicles are inevitably mentioned as a part of the solution. Today on the Odd Couple podcast, we are honored to have Mr. Randeer Singh, Director Electric Mobility at Niti Aayog, the apex public policy think tank of the Government of India. Mr. Randeer is a leading member of e-mobility at Niti Aayog, including Advanced Chemical Cell Program. He is part of the BIS Standard Review Committee for EV Infrastructure leads the Shunya campaign and state EV policy program steered by Niti Aayog in addition to several other projects. He has worked in the corporate sector for more than 13 years. He's a B.Tech from National Institute of Technology, Bhopal, and an MBA from IIM, Calcutta. Welcome to the Odd Couple podcast, Randir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, sir. Thank you. It's such a great honor to have you here. Nobody better than you, I think, is positioned right now in India to come down and explain to us and help us understand this revolution which is passing us by right now as we go on. I'd like to start our conversation and take you a little bit back to, I think, early 1960s and 70s when there was already electric vehicles which were being produced, but it never really did catch on but then cut like 40 to 60 years now what really has changed globally or you know geopolitically that people are thinking now that electric vehicles has a position first of all thank you for having me here now let's talk about the vehicles or the automotives as such not only about the electric so you know the vehicles all around the world started with electric only there was no ICA vehicles it's only the electric vehicles with which we started this automotive revolution. You know, electric vehicle is because very simple. It's like a toy. You have the electric powertrain. You have a fuel in terms of the power storage, which is the cell. And then it powers the motor to move. And you know, motor is something which we have manufactured and gained the maximum efficiency out of that. So that's how like a toy and electric vehicle works. And that's what we did in the beginning of automotive revolution. So that's how everything started. After that, we have already seen the great oil saga comes. There were great developments in the assembly of the vehicles. The Ford has reduced the cost due to the assembly. There were a lot of developments in the IC engines, internal combustion engines. And that's how the entire saga changed from the electric vehicles to the automotive. And after that, there was no turning back. In the 70s, 80s also, there were some vehicles which were from, from the electric. But what has changed recently is the focus. And that focus is the climate focus. That is something which has changed recently. When we talk about the climate focus, the first thing which comes to everybody's mind is to shift from the fossil fuel. Our dependency on the fossil fuel has to reduce and finally every country has to be the net zero according to their own commitments. That's what happened during the COP26 also. That's what happened during the Paris Pact also. So now this shift has happened. Everybody's focus is now find out the measures and what possible measures we need to shift to the green transition. And when we talk about the shifting to the green transition, transport sector cannot be left behind. This is something which consumes a hell lot of fossil fuel in addition to the, you know, the power which is charging the vehicles and also of our homes, industries and all that power I'm talking about. That also takes a lot of fossil fuels. So these are the areas which has to be in focus. Now the decarbonization of the transport has to be done and what are the immediate solutions available. Understand? So this is why the focus. I totally get it. I I mean, I didn't know we started from electric and then went to IC. That itself is a revelation of sorts. And now we are back to uh, having EV as a focus. But 
how much has technology changed? Because until Elon Musk came with Tesla, there were small players in the market, but it was very, very small percentage of sorts. But he came and changed saying that, okay, it can be a cool looking car. It can have the performance. It can have everything. And it kind of triggered the change for other manufacturers to focus on electric vehicles. So in terms of battery technology, what is the kind of leap that has happened that is enabling all this happening at a such a fast pace? So if we see a decade back, let's go a decade back, the price of one kilowatt hour was more than $1,000. Today, one kilowatt hour, the price has reached $237. That is the big delta which we have achieved, that cost parity. And you know, if it is not affordable, it's not available. If it is affordable, then only it's adaptable. So that's how the things has changed. It has become affordable, available and adaptable. All these things have happened because of this drastic reduction. Almost 86 to 87% cost has reduced. But the catch is not only the cost has reduced, but the learning curve in terms of the technology has also improved. We just see the learning curve over the past five years. It's more than 17% year on year. That is what the learning curve is in terms of the cells, which powers these vehicles. The cells are basically storage medium. This stores the energy. But so in a particular volume, how much energy can be stored? That is something which is being achieved. So earlier, say the watt hour per kg. Watt hour is your energy. Per kg is the weight. In a particular weight, how much watt hour you can put in, say five years back, that almost doubled now. So that means in the same volume, the energy which you can pack within the cell has also increased. That means now you have the same pack size, but the range which it provides is now doubled. So all these developments has happened the past 10 or 20 years. 1990, 1991 was the time when the first time that lithium ion cells were commercialized. So after this commercialization, everything expanded. Yeah, I must say and point it out, one thing is that and we are not talking about the lead acid batteries and we shouldn't talk about that also. Because those are not something which forms a part of EV revolution. I think also we have our, the smartphones, I think would have lent a lot to this battery development because I remember older smartphones, you know, how short the duration used to be. And today now, you know, with all this lithium ion technology and improving the battery life, I think that also helped improving that lithium ion technology to what it is today, where we have vehicles now, which can travel up to 800 kilometers, right? I think we were discussing that, but on an average, roughly around 200 to 300 kilometers it can give you and i think that was one of the biggest drawbacks in early evs where they were not able to give you the range and also it was the power right so, but now like you said the technology has bridged that gap now where it's able to deliver us that much power as well as the range for these vehicles which has made it a little bit more interesting for uh, the newer generation which is looking for these cars but I want to ask you, sir, but also during the 80s, right, and then early 90s, probably, there was also the development of hybrid vehicles, right, like hydrogen cell, ethanol. But why is EV more, you know, interesting compared to the others? So if we see the atomic table, hydrogen is the atomic number one. That's the lightest element. So what is the issue with the lightest element? That it can pass through any, even the smallest of the pores, which is not visible by the eyes. Where will you store such a thing? Specialized vessels are required. So this is one. Second thing is about the efficiency. So when we talk about fuel cells, what does what happens in the fuel cells? First, you electrolyze the water. You take out the hydrogen from it. First, you have to compress. Then you have to store. Then you have to transport. And then you have to again mix it and then produce the energy. So you know, this is the total cycle which you are using. So what happens in case of the battery electric vehicles or EVs, the power which you produce, you directly store in the cells and then you directly use it. Far more efficient. Yeah, so it's 73 to 90% efficiency in the battery electric vehicles versus 23% efficiency in the hydrogen fuel cells. Over and above this is the issue of the transport, storage and the safety because you know, handling the hydrogen in itself it's very, very dangerous. So until and unless the efficiency, storage 
and the safe handling of these issues are not resolved at a very basic level the proliferation of such technologies would be tough nevertheless in certain areas where the battery electric vehicles might not be feasible as of now those are the areas wherein the hydrogen powered things will work like in industries it will work in the shipping it will work even in for the aircrafts it will work there is a operation called taxing in case of the aircrafts where aircrafts are just pulled that is the place where the hydrogen power will work the fuel cells will work so these are some of the areas where definitely hydrogen is going to be the one of the solutions for sure but right now looking at the technology maturity the handling which we can do and the safety parts all these things together along with the the adaptation which has increased also globally the electric vehicles is the one i'm not saying about the hybrid i'm talking about the pure ev pure electric vehicles are the ones which are very promising and are the future that's very interesting i mean you you talked about the technology and how it's improved and you know how uh, compared to other vehicles where electric is far more efficient in producing power and transferring that power and so that is why it has held its uh, own ground but it also comes down to the fact of infrastructure also no sir because like what you were saying about storing your uh, hydrogen and everything was not safe and it's not cost effective also it's far more expensive you'll have to build hydrogen stations in every city and every place so i think that's where maybe with the battery technology now changing where we have just stations which are just put up where there are batteries there and people can come swap their batteries go out put in a new cell i mean that is there on the mobiles now you know i don't know if you know but they are renting batteries out and it's so convenient you know i run out of charge i just plug a battery and then walk and i think that's moving on to ev and that is the infrastructure so can you throw some light on the infrastructure part of it sir? so you know in india it takes time for things to come but it takes very little time for things to be adapted and to improve well said sir yeah, we have seen this something like this in the telecom sector also we are the world's cheapest and the maximum number of users in india in terms of the broadband as well as the tech we are the biggest in the world and the cheapest now how did it happen it happened because there are disruptions in this market which has happened which are nowhere else in the world disruptions in terms of the model business model disruption in terms of the technology also the type of technology which has to be deployed in our country all those things together actually contributed for this cheapest and the biggest market now the similar thing has to happen in this market also in evs it took time for us to adapt to the evs in fact i should say last year after we remodeled the fame to incentives in 2021 in june after that only the biggest proliferation of the registered vehicles in high speed has been noticed and now this is the right time when the industry has to come out with different business models and the battery as a service so to say battery swapping is the one which is of course going to be the big game changer 21st of april 2022 niti aayog has actually released a draft battery swapping policy This is the first time in the world ever the battery swapping policy has been released by any country, and we have already concluded three public consultations. The policy is in public domain, and it's open for the comments till fifth of June, where people can give their comments. It, it touch base everything, all the aspects of the battery swapping. Now, why it is important for our country to have such a thing? As you rightly said, first of all, we have decoupled the vehicle with the battery. now the vehicle and the battery they are almost in terms of the cost is 50 50 that means if we have decoupled you need not to own the battery you have to own the vehicle so that means vehicle capex cost is already 50% so that means we have half the cost so earlier if the vehicle was coming in 100000 rupees now it is coming 50000 rupees but the biggest thing is when you were buying the vehicle with the 100000 and the fixed battery was there what was the biggest risk in your vehicle biggest risk was the technology obsolescence of what of battery cells now you don't have that risk so you own the vehicle at half of cost without running this risk so you can run the vehicle for many many years and the in terms of the battery that you will take on subscription model when the battery swapping the charge point operators they will have their you know the battery points at every kirana store pan shop fuel pump anywhere 
these are very small battery swap stations wherein you just go take out your battery put your discharge battery into the system take out the fully charged battery put it in your system less than 2 minutes and then you are ready to go with the full charge so zero downtime that is the model which is better the battery swapping which this is very interesting and this type of development i think is an eye opener to most people because i don't think a lot of people know about this and i think this is very relevant to you said considering the fact that uh, you were going to buy a car and you were talking about similar things i think uh, we'll take a break right now and come back on the other side and hear said story and let's talk more with uh, mr randeer you're listening to the old couple podcast old couple po- podcast A Pandemia Inc. production. Are you ready? A friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two. Check it out! Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. So welcome to the Odd Couple Podcast. We have Mr. Randeer Singh of Niti Aayog, who's the director of EV Mobility. And we are very excited to have him where we are discussing about electric vehicles and future of mobility in India and across the world. So where we left off was from the infrastructure and, and what all policies the government of India has adopted and trying to implement. But here's a thing which I experienced from my own perspective. So I was in the market to buy a car. and i eventually ended up buying a petrol automatic tata nexon but i wanted to buy an electric vehicle of tata nexon or any other thing but what i realized was i paid 14 lakhs for my car but the ev i had to pay 17 lakhs so i need to pay 3 lakhs more to buy even though my intention is to go green my intention is to adopt this technology and be part of this change but right now it is cost prohibitive right and also my other concern was the infrastructure is still not there yet but i'm very confident that my next car will definitely be an ev once this whole thing is set up uh, the charging times are reduced the range is increased and this battery swapping technology seems amazing but these are the problems of adoption at least the way i see it and just to add and obviously not to paint any kind of a negative picture on this we've had these uh, electric bikes going up in flames across the country and that kind of brings a little question mark on the safety front but i would love to hear from you in terms of cost of adoption is very high right now and is things are going to change from that front so uh, there's something called total cost of ownership so when you buy a vehicle there's one cost which you pay up front and then there are two types of cost which you have to incur over the period of time one is operational cost and the another one is the maintenance cost so when you own the vehicle the total cost of ownership is upfront cost operational cost plus the maintenance cost these three costs together equals to the total cost of ownership of course it can be broken down further now what what comprises of the operational cost fuel cost is the biggest chunk out of the operation cost and then you have later on the engine oil and other things and what comprises of the annual and this maintenance cost you have the breakdown in the engine you have the breakdown in the turbo charges and other places so you will not face all these issues and the things in the eve so whenever you have to buy a vehicle so if you go to somebody who is running a you know the fleet of the commercial vehicles even for the ic they always talk about the total cost of ownership how much is the total cost of ownership of a particular vehicle so there are multiple commercial vehicles available from the multiple companies what tata is providing daimler is providing aisha is providing and if you see the total cost of ownership across domain the same uh, tonnage of the tata truck aisha truck and the daimler truck there is a different total cost of ownership so whenever commercial vehicle buyer goes for anything if he wants to buy it for the 5 years he will see what is the total cost of ownership and where it comes at cheapest this is something which we have to make people aware about that when you go for the total cost of ownership you you'll not buy the vehicle and sell it immediately right at least you will run it for 3 or 5 years right so you have to see over the period of the 5 years what is the total cost you are going to incur this is one so in terms of the total cost of ownership ev comes cheaper even as of now second thing which i actually accept is an issue right now is the financing a lot of efforts are already being made even the state governments and the industry has come forward without the industry support these things will not be mitigated the buyback programs you know the confidence in the product 
that this product will survive for so many years because there is no resale market currently available. All these things, buyback program, warranties, guarantees, inclusion of the fintechs in this, availability of the credit history of the people through other means, all those things will actually help to get the EV financing at the lower rate, which is a challenge. But I think uh, from the total cost of ownership perspective, it's not a challenge. Upfront cost, of course, it's a bit higher, which has to be, which will be tackled by the EV financing. Now, the second part of your question is about the EV fires. Of course, this is a sunrise sector. This is the sector which has been, which is right now just picking up. And anything bad from any side, and if it is the safety perspective, definitely it's something which is detrimental. It puts a lot of questions in the minds of the consumers that this newer technology is proven or not, what are the issues, what the government is doing. And I can assure you, in fact, you have also seen that not only the companies have taken Sumomoto things and they have recalled the vehicles, uh, which, which has happened around the world. There are cases with the Volvo, with the BMW, with the Mercedes Benz, with the GM also, EVs only, and even the Teslas. Such incidents have happened and they have recalled their vehicles, they have also fixed their vehicles. And the same is happening in the Indian industry also. Nevertheless, the government has already initiated an investigation in particular to such cases. And the report will be out soon and we will be known will be knowing what are the reasons behind this. But there are a few things which actually we as a consumer also need to notice that there are certain things which has to be used in certain way. For example, if you have been asked that please charge your vehicle through an authorized point only, through the authorized charger only, please follow those best practices. So there are certain guidelines which as a consumer also we need to follow. But of course as an industry and the government, a lot of things from the awareness perspective has to be done. And from the safety parameters perspective, you know, India has the world's stringent battery testing code, AIS 156. That's world's stringent battery testing code. And the batteries are tested from uh, using one AIS 156. Uh, from the last year October itself and the, this year October onwards it will be mandatory for every battery has to be tested as, as per that. Earlier it was tested as per 048. Yeah, I'm sure you know that you know we are going through that whole transition phase and you know there will be a few isolated issues but like you're saying it's being looked into and um, sometimes you know the consumers also and we as Indians hmm, you know sometimes I don't really follow all the rules. <laughs> You know, instead of plugging it in that standard thing, I'll just plug it somewhere else. So we don't know, you know, I mean, it's there in the media, we, we hear about it, but we don't really know the full story about it. So I'm sure it's being looked into and it's going to be addressed, you know, in the proper manner. But um, I'd like to now come to government and taxes because that's the next big problem for us, you know, taxes. Now, a few states I heard are suggesting that they will remove their, what is it, road taxes for EV vehicles. Will we see something like that where the government will try to, you know, uh, entice the buyers to move them towards EV by reducing road tax for the EV vehicles? So there are two types of incentives. One is at the federal level, another is that at the state level. At the federal level, again, this can be divided into two forms, fiscal and the non-fiscal incentives. So exemption of the road tax, exemption of the permit, we can call it as a non-fiscal incentive. Till now, 18 states have already released their EV policy, already released and notified. 18 states and the union territories. Plus four has already released the draft in the public domain. And almost all of these states has exempted the road tax and the permits for the EVs. In addition to several other things like the uh, tariff rates are reduced. Over and over what the central government is providing as a fame incentive. There are incentives built in even in these policies also. So you, you get the fame incentive, you get the incentives from the states also. Even in some states the insurance amount has also been waived off. So I mean all the list is available in the public domain itself. You can also visit the website which is launched by the Niti Ayo during the COP. 26, the name of the website is e Amrit, e Amrit portal. Every information related to electric vehicles, you can find it there. Thanks for clarifying that, Mr. Randeer. Another question that we have was, I mean, we've 
seen what the advantages of EV are, how much the go- government of India is pushing towards adoption of EV and how citizens like us are ready to adopt. But there is a factor of sustainability over here. While electric vehicles bring down the consumption of fossil fuels like petrol and diesel, there is, I mean, the car- battery still needs to be charged. And a country like India, where we are still coal dependent, I think about 40 to 50% of our power supply comes from thermal power plants. So what is the future on that? And how do we negate that? And what is the plan for the future? So that it becomes one is far more sustainable. And the second part of my question is majority of the battery which is being produced, especially lithium, is being imported, right? How much is going to be manufactured in India? How much of Atmanirbhar is going to be the focus uh, so that the cost again comes down? Uh, Let me start answering your question from the last one. So in terms of the cell, imported cells, that's correct. In almost right now, almost 100% of the cells which go into the uh, EVs are imported. But government of India has already awarded the production link incentive called Advanced Chemistry Cell Program, 18,100 crore, around 2.5 billion US dollars. This has already been awarded for 50 gigawatt hour of the production. That has already been awarded. Four successful bidders are there. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, last month only the bidders has been announced and it's already uh, out. So these four successful bidders have the mandate that within next two years, they have to produce the first cell, not only produce, but sell in the market. And then on that, whatever selling price they are having and whatever they have quoted, they will get the value on that. But the catch is they have to achieve minimum 25% localization at cell level, not at the battery level, at the cell level, minimum 25% localization in two years. This is the most aggressive target in the world ever when we have no supply chain as of now. They have accepted it, but we have also done our due diligence that this is possible and this can be achieved. Second thing is in next three years, that means five years from now, they have to achieve 60% of localization at cell level. And all this can be achieved even if we don't have the raw material. So raw material excluded with the rest of all things, the total potential is to achieve 80 percent but then because of the non-existent supply chain in the market here the target is 60 percent so within five years they have to achieve the localization at cell level up to 60 percent then only they will be eligible for the you know the incentive which is being awarded under acc pli for these successful bidders in addition to this for the cells for the promising and the upcoming technologies, there is another program of half a billion US dollar, which will be announced soon by the government of India in the next one to two months. So this is called Niche ACC program. It is also being approved along with the previous ACC program. It was also gazette notified by the cabinet. So this is another program which will again tackle to the further better technologies, and that is called the Niche ACC program. This is about that. Does this answer the last part of your question? Absolutely, Crystal. And uh, uh, can you repeat? The first part was about the renewable yes. source of... Uh, so, you know, there's two things. One thing is the recycling. So, do you know in US also, how much gigawatt hour is manufactured? They might have sold the vehicles which have now, you know, uh, 100 or 150 gigawatt hour in that. But they don't produce more than 2 gigawatt hour. So, where from all the vehicles have come? They have also imported. So to nudge and to initial start, they have also imported everything. But now they are all, they are also developing, investing heavily in the battery production, the cell production. And we can, I can say that we are in fact faster in this. Now the, comes the second part. How to reduce this dependency? So there is something called usage of the recycled parts. So when these batteries are used, so in automotive, the batteries, once they are used in, the, uh, in your EV, they are not directly discharged or the recycled because they still have almost 80% of their capacity left. So they are put in the second use. After the second use only, in second use, you can use them as a stationary storage in your homes, in the industries, in the telecom towers. These are the places where the second use of these automotive batteries can be done. Advanced chemistry cells. After that, they go for the recycling and around 95% of the original raw material, original mineral, original metals can be recovered out of this 
and this again goes into the supply chain. So there is a study which says if you put the 15% of this recycled material again into the manufacturing of the newer cells, you can reduce 15 to 20% of the cost of the cell. So this not only brings down the dependency on the raw material, but also reduces the cost. So this is something which comes here. One more question actually you asked about the dependency on the fossil fuel based power generation in our country. So we have done a study. So even as of now, when we have around 65% from the fossil fuel based power, even with this much power mix, I would say, if you charge currently our vehicle, then also it's better in terms of the total carbon emissions over the lifetime for the vehicle. Even today, it's better in terms of the EVs. You actually emit lesser emissions. We have a study. And by 2030, when you know the COP Prime Minister has given five commitments in terms of we have to reduce uh, our carbon emissions, for carbon intensity also we have to reduce, 1 billion tons of CO2 emissions we have to reduce from 2022 to 2030 with the base year considering at 2022. So all these things will be done when we shift to the renewable power. So now earlier our target was 450 plus gigawatt. Now our targets has also to be increased. By 2030, even this will become more sustainable. Very interesting. Amazing how I was expecting more of an answer about we're going to build more solar cells, we're going to use more hydropower, but I didn't know we we're going to answer it with recycling and, you know, upscaling our used products. So that's really, you know, innovative on your end. And I can just see what a vision you all have, you know, for the future. But before we end this thing, I have to ask you one last question about our public transport. Are we going to see a massive change in our public transport where we move to EV also? Is there a plan? So, uh, in fact, you know, the good and the biggest news. Last month, India has opened the world's biggest public bus tender in EV. 5,000 plus buses. That is the world's biggest single tender for the EV buses. Five cities have already adopted it. So, if you see the focus of the government, when I talked about the fame incentives, in the fame incentives, more than 35% of the total 10,000 crores is allotted only to the public transport, that is the buses, EV buses. So that's what the focus is. The focus is the public transport. So this 5,000 buses, these are for the five cities. Now we are going for the next round of the 10,000 buses in EVs, the price discovery for 10,000 buses. And we have already received the interest from the tier 1 and tier 2 cities for 6,000 plus buses. So there is a massive transformation which is going to come in the public transport sector. EV buses are not only comfortable and air conditioned, but also there is no tailpipe emissions as well as the, there is no noise pollution. So there you go. We are thinking about it and they are already doing it. So, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to the next, I think the next five years is going to be really exciting in this space, you know, for all the tech buffs out there, you know, who are listening and, you know, looking forward to what's going to come exciting times right Sid? absolutely exciting and cleaner air we can breathe easier and we won't worry if fuel prices hit 200 rupees also i guess once we move to ev which i'm pretty sure will happen very soon thank you so much mr randeer for joining us on the odd couple podcast it was an absolute revelation of what government of india is doing what niti ayog is empowering them with with their suggestions and from a technology perspective how much india is at the forefront setting standards globally so thank you so much for coming on the Odd Couple Podcast. We will chat with you soon to see what the cutting edge is in the future. Thank you so much. Happy motoring.